Welcome and bienvenue, Kadichiwa, Ni Hao, Jambo, Marhaba. It's time for the Armist Inquisition yet again, episode 203 on <laughs> Sunday, the 10th of October 2021. I'm Armish Phil. I'm Armish Ben. And I'm Armish Matt. And we've got Steve Whitehead here from the Sporting History Podcast. How are you, Steve? G'day, guys. Thanks for having me on. It's a real pleasure. Oh, the pleasure's all ours. We, uh, we love talking about ancient history. We do quite a bit on ancient history over here on the Army Shink, don't we? Yeah, it's uh, endlessly yeah. fascinating. <laughs> it is, yeah. And uh, you have your own podcast. Uh, if you're watching on the YouTube, you can see the uh, the link there. At, uh, what is it? www.spartanhistory.com. Spartanhistorypodcast.com. That's right. And That's correct. How long have you been going now? Yeah, guys, yeah, a little bit uh, over two years now. Started off in November of, uh, sorry, almost two years now, 2019. We started off and um, yeah, just hitting 30 episodes out now. So, yeah, things are going well. So about once a month they come out generally? Yeah, once a month. Look, I don't really take it that seriously. And to be honest, when I first started the podcast, the only person I thought would ever listen to it was myself. So <laughs> I was just really, you know, beholden to what I felt like doing. Then people started listening and sending in comments and started requesting some things. I thought, oh. Christ, you know, I'm going to have to take this a little bit more seriously. So, yeah, look, once a month ostensibly, but, um, yeah, you never know. I mean, what? Wh why Sparta? Yeah, I mean, you, you could have picked all sorts of subjects from sort of the ancient world. What what sort of produced this fascination with you with Sparta particularly? Mm, it's a good question. Um, I mean, I'm not academically trained at all. I did do a little bit of the arts in, in university, never completed a degree, but um, I think my first thought was to go for, for Roman history and go for the most popular one. But there were a series of podcasts that were already out of the universe. Mike Duncan's um, history of Rome, oh, first and foremost. Um, love it. You know, yeah. I mean, if you're going to go into Roman history, you're going to want to be competing against that. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to go up against that guy. He's too, too popular. And look, Sparta has always been a fascination of mine. Um, my, my firstborn son has the name Leonidas. So I'm a, <laughs> a bit of a, it was a big, big name getting over the line when your partner wanted a name like James or George. Getting Leonidas was a really tough one over the line. But I'm a salesman by vocation, so I thought, look, <laughs> the, Spart <laughs> the Spartan story is one that's not told told in its whole. It's told very popularly through, um, you know, Frank Miller's graphic novel and um, Jack Snyder's movie. But uh, the whole story had never been told, so I thought there was a real opportunity to sort of yeah tell the story from the beginning and work right through to what other people know. Wow, so in your podcast you're going, so, I mean, what sort of sources are, are we reliant on? Is it mainly Herodotus or is there other Greeks that we've got information on the Spartans from? Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. Um, Herodotus, obviously, being the father of history, he takes up the, the Spartan narrative at the point where they were uh, the preeminent military power of Greece alongside Athens being the preeminent naval power. Uh, but the Spartan history and the story goes back uh, anywhere up to 800 years before that. If you look back to, to Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, uh, the Spartans play a fairly pivotal role in there, obviously, with, with Helen, uh, the princess of Sparta, and Menelaos, the um, Mycenaean king who, who, who marries her and later follows her to Troy after she abdicates with or is raped by, by Paris, that city's prince. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a quest to go back to the start, which is, which is Homer's narrative, and try to tell the story right through the Bronze Age, through the Dark Age that separates that from the Iron Age into the Iron Age period where, um, you know, the popular narratives are picked up by Herodotus and Thucydides. But before those two guys, yeah, the sources are very patchy, and that's, that's the same for all archaic uh, age Greeks. You don't get a lot of information. There. There's some poetry. There's some very, very um, early uh, script work, but there's not a lot of dedicated source like Herodotus is the first one but yeah you're, you're piecing things together you're using archaeology using um, ethnography as well to piece the story together and it's a fascinating one because the view is that you know Sparta arrives on the scene as fully fledged nation ready to you know kick Persia's butt 
on the fields of Plataea and Thermopylae. But, um, you know, they had hundreds of years of development before that. So that's the sort of, that's where I'm out of the story. In fact, I've, I've done 30 episodes and not once spoken about uh, the Greco-Persian Wars as of yet. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Gonna, yeah sorry, I was going to ask you then. So when does it kind of appear on the scene, Sparta? When does it, what, where have you, or when and where have you kind of traced it back to? Mm. Yeah, well, I guess without going too far into the weeds, the, the Spartans of the, of the Homeric narratives are probably better referred to as Archaeans. That was the type of Greek that was around at those times. Achilles. Um, mm. Achilles, yeah. Achilles was an Archean, yep. Yeah. Um, Agamemnon, all those guys were Archaeans. Um, uh-huh, right, Homer okay. uses the word seven or seven or eight hundred times throughout the two books to refer to the Greeks. There's Danaeans as well. There's um, Argives as well, which is a city in the Peloponnese, not far from Sparta, but predominantly he uses the word Archaeans. And it's a word you pick up later in Greece too, but it almost seems like after the Troy, there was a, a collapse of Bronze Age societies in the Mediterranean. And there, then there was a migration of peoples after that. And it looks like the Spartan peoples, their, their family group of, of people came into the Peloponnese, which is the, the bell end area of, of Greece down there from the north uh, called the Dorian people. And they supplanted the native population. So there were still Achaeans in that, in that area uh, when the Spartans were at their prime, but, the Spartan story, the true Spartan story, is a is a Dorian story. Now, like most of the other Greeks, they tried to tie themselves into that Bronze Age heroic narrative, but there really is two Spartas: the the Bronze Age Sparta and the the Iron Age Sparta, which is more popularly understood. Right. So that's what they refer to in the as the Dorian invasion, the the migration from north <laughs> into the Peloponnese, which is sort of the southwest of Greece. Mm-hmm. Yeah, precisely. Wow. It's. Uh, I just find it so romantic looking back at all these ancient civilizations that trace their um, the roots back to the Ili- to um, Homer. The Iliad. Yeah. Well, yeah. He was, you know, that sort of poetry, that style was um, was in vogue, I guess, in that time. I mean, Homer himself was probably three or four hundred years after the legendary events of of Troy. But look, there's, you know, obviously there's a lot of archaeological evidence to support that there was possibly a, a war in that area and, and definitely some sort of you know globalized trade network that was going on in the eastern sector of the mediterranean yeah. uh the mycenaeans were were obviously the the powerful cultural driving force of greece during that period and they had interactions with the hittite empire uh which was in asia minor to the east and troy was somewhere on the, the liminal boundaries between those two sort of two great empires and you can imagine that it was a real stomping ground, a real proving ground for, for armies back in those times. It's not, not hard to imagine Greek armies or Mycenaean armies fighting Asiatic armies at that stage. Yeah, the, the sort of the, they believe that the archaeological site of Troy is on the, the sort of what, <coughs> the, what is now the west coast of Turkey, what was um, Anatolia, they used mm. to call it. So sort of directly opposite Greece in that mm-hmm. sense, So, which makes sense with the, the Homeric stories. Um, we we had David Roll on our podcast uh, a few months ago. who's an Egyptologist by trade, mm-hmm. and we're t- he was telling us all about the, this Greek Dark Age or lack thereof. He reckons oh, that yeah. there's <laughs> he reckons there's a problem with the Egyptian because um, ancient Egypt is used to sort of calibrate all the other evidence we have, and it, he reckons there's a problem with the timeline. And essentially, the Greek Dark Age didn't happen. Mm. that there was just maybe a 50-year lull, maybe, mm-hmm. and that there is actual cultural continuity from Mycenae to the early, when, when ancient Greece, as we know it, plumps into, uh, uh, into view. And it makes sense from, from other, in, in other ways. So, for example, um, like um, uh, Aeneas. So in... in uh, the Aeneid, Aeneas going and finding Dido uh, in Carthage. You know, Aeneas is supposed to be in fleeing the Trojan War, the, uh, the collapse of the Bronze Age, but Carthage doesn't turn up in the historical records for like 300 years after that. So a lot of what he was saying sort of makes sense. I don't know if that's something you've ever come across. Yeah, yeah, look, I, I, I can't really speak to the Egyptian side of things, though, you know, as far as using them as a reference point for for other elements of history, it is a great 
lodestone, I guess, for lack of a better term, whereby you've got a fairly continuous run of records and you can cross-reference anything else that you find with what's going on in Egypt and get dating through that method. Yeah. There are other other ways, but that's a, a really good way of doing it. But as far as the Dark Age goes in Greece, it's probably a it's a little bit of a misnomer in that it wasn't, you know, completely dark in all regions and, and nor was the light diffused uh, entirely in every yeah. pocket. Uh, you see little croppings up here and there. There was definitely a period, say, of maybe 150, 200 years where there was a denuded sort of population. Um, some estimates say that at least 90% of the population uh, either died off or, or moved away, probably more likely the latter. Um, and obviously writing was was entirely lost throughout the peninsula. There was a transference from uh, the Greek language from linear B text, which was the, the script of the Mycenaeans to um, what you'd call the Ionic alphabet or the Greek alphabet that came through sort of in the mid eighth to early seventh century i would suggest um and because there's no writing during that phase people will typically call it a dark age because there's no enlightenment but um mm. there was definitely definitely archaeological development in the area um you know population centers were rebuilding you know whatever occurred at, after the fall of troy was <coughs> in general throughout um the eastern mediterranean um there's been a lot of work done on like, archaeosites seismology so like earthquakes that happened in the area um climate change also yeah. affected things you know there was there was there was whatever happened you know there was there was in, invasions by the sea peoples i guess like they, they said they're loosely described um you know they're like some sort of mythical boogie member no <laughs> something like that occurred there's enough record in even linear b text of, of of invaders coming from the north and ships coming in from the sea to burn and ravage and all that so yeah look there there, there wasn't a, a period of complete darkness in the Greek peninsula, the Greek mainland, but there was a denudence of, of light and reason, I suppose. I guess the point, part of the reason that we're so reliant on the Egyptian chronology is that they were the main superpower before the Bronze Age collapse, and they're pretty much the only civilization, civilization that managed to carry on, whereas, you know, the Mycenaeans disappeared um the babylonians and the assyrians they kind of the hittites get wiped out completely the babylonians and assyrians sort of disappear and then come back as the neo assyrians and the neo babylonians so i guess that's why we're so reliant on egyptian chronology because they sort of stood the test of this soup of uh disastrous things that were happening at that time Absolutely. And, and moreover, the Egyptians heavily influenced all of the neighbours, neighbouring countries, um, you know, religious practices, their their architecture, their art. You can see all of the, you know, I guess the, the central motifs to, to Greek art and architecture, even during the classical period and particularly the archaic period coming straight out of Egypt. You know, the, the sphinxes, the, the griffins, you know, the, the types of columns, the poses of the statues and things like that. You know, Egypt, Egyptian, Egypt was an absolute powerhouse in the Mediterranean and was really the, the great survivor over so many different dynasties and different kingdoms and different eras, they, you know, maintained a fairly homogenous culture through all of that time. And they defeated the sea peoples. Yeah. At the end of the day. So, well, so we're told. Mm -hmm. this... Well, they tell us that they tell us that themselves. Yeah. yeah. They've, uh, I think it's, I think it's Ramesses the third, I think who had a, a massive victory over the sea peoples and carved it all over his, um, his tomb. You know, there was a, a carving of a giant Ramesses, you know, slaying thousands of these minister sea people. Smiting, Yay. smiting away. Oh, there's even like, you know, little sea people's trying to crawl up from the river that he's knocked them into and they're drowning. And, oh, it's, it's very dramatic, but it's, um, you know, it's yeah, big Ramesses is the good guy. Yeah, no, they, they certainly did. It's such a sort of, it's so brutal, isn't it? When we look at it with our modern sensibilities and, mm -hmm. you know, we, we sort of have such a sheltered life here in the West, or we have at least for the last... 60 or 70 years we've had a pretty we've led a pretty blessed existence mm -hmm. i mean if we sort of all right we'll for, forget about the cold war and the threat of imminent nuclear <laughs> annihilation <laughs> annihilation all right but maybe i think our generation i think i, I would yeah. argue, you know we were born in 82 83 mm. you know other than maybe the aids scare the aids yeah of, of the 80s, yeah. you know, we've had a pretty blessed... We've had a good run, haven't we? Well, compared to, you know, bring it back to, you know, if you um, grew up as a Spartan. I mean, what 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 would it be like, Steve, if, if you're born into a Spartan family as a baby? What can you expect? Well, I guess it's probably, uh, without getting into the, the Spartan mirage and, and the popular perception of Sparta and, and the actual perception, if you were born as a son of a homoioi 
Spartan, that is the, the upper echelons of society, you know, born into the warrior tradition of, um, of fighting in Spartan armies and, and subjugating the helots, you would have had a life of absolute hell, one that would probably <laughs> see you sitting on a dimpled couch when you're older, talking about your mummy and daddy issues to some Ooh. expert. You're paying $160 an hour. Uh, you know, from, from the moment you were born, you were, were tested to see if you were uh, willing and able to be able to stand in the front line against Sparta's enemies. You know, you were, you were taken to a board of, of ephors, which was a council of, of uh, a yearly elected council of, of elders, I guess, who had the, uh, the ephors were responsible for you, for the, for the morals of society and the dignity of society. And the babe would be inspected if it, if it cried uh, out too suddenly, or if it was, if it showed any fear towards these strange people, it was cast into, into the, the canyon you've probably seen in that, that lovely movie uh, 300 there. Yeah. Now, you know, there, there's some debate where, whether this happened or not. And there has been such a place discovered near Sparta and it does, it does have human remains within it, but most of the remains, if not all, are, are adult remains. So it's thought mm. that it was a place that prisoners were thrown. But that was the thought. The babe was also bathed in, in wine and in red wine that was believed to have, have tampered the spirit and tempered the, the muscles and the bone structure of, of the child. <laughs> wow. If it survived that that those those two tests then uh, from the age of, of five or six it was taken from its mother and father into what was known as the agoge which was the um translated into english it basically means the rearing which is more to refer to cattle and the spartans had a lot of uh names that sort of related to to the herdsman's life and the rearing life and from there you would be separated from your family for the next 12 years where you would be uh ritualistically <laughs> starved beaten Okay. Uh, cast out into the wild and expected to survive in you know, very, very harsh conditions. And if you survived those tests, then your reward was another 42 years of, of battle on the front lines. <laughs> and look, you know, it, wasn't, it wasn't all terrible. I mean, you had, a, you had some land that was worked by, by the slave class, the helots. Uh, you were obviously fed. You were required to dine in, in communal halls. But you look for a Spartan child, uh, life would have been terribly harsh you know there's a story of of uh, a spartan boy that was captured with a with a fox uh that he that he'd caught and he was hiding it within his cloak he didn't want to get caught by his um by his educators by his by his controllers and they demanded to see what he had in, within his cloak and rather than then give up the fact that he found this fox and kept it he was intending to eat it because that was starved so often uh he kept his mouth shut meanwhile the fox gnawed through his innards and before the teacher, the boy collapsed dead in front of him rather than, you know, cry out for help or give away that he'd stolen. That's how scared they were of being found out. So, I mean, what would the yeah. punishment have been? He would have been gnawed to death by the fox, probably. God, God only knows. God only knows. But, but a beating for sure. Yeah, they were, they were regularly beaten. Um, they, had, they had exercises where they had to, you know, run to an altar and, and grab some cheese off it. Meanwhile, the, che the, the altar was stood upon by several priests with sticks and beat them while they tried to do it. It's a very, very old... It's called diamastigosis in Greek. It's a very strange word, but it literally means trying to steal cheese while, while getting beaten. Um, yeah, it's hard to say, but look, all punishments are corporal. Um, and the ultimate fear would have been to be excluded from the, the Spartan class of, of warriors and become part of the hippomionis, the, the inferiors, so, which is uh, the people who didn't like it. So basically, this was this was the higher echelons of society then where you were sort of kind of subjected to this. So um, the, basically was it like the Spartans then who did this and then there was just a slave class. Was it like nobody in between? Yeah. The people who the, who the, <laughs> the soldiers capture, you know, when you invade, yeah, well, you've well, got to get your slaves in. Yeah. So there's just slaves no. and Spartans basically. No, no. In fact, the, the Spartans were, were very small. The, the Spartans, when we say the Spartans, mm. we were referring to the red cloaked you know, yeah. warriors with the upside yeah. down V on their shield. Yeah, the, and the, the lack of the ones. Yeah, beards. Yeah, so the, the helots were a uh, native indigenous people for the most part. It's a bit of um, conjecture over whether they were Archaeans, as right. in the Mycenaeans that were still there. Some of them almost certainly were. The other ones were, there was two parts of, of I guess, Laconia, sorry, of the Spartan Empire in the Peloponnese, there was Laconia, where the Spartans' homeland was, and Messenia, which is to the west. When they conquered Messenia, they enslaved the locals there too, who were who were Dorian ancestors, Dorian cousins of the Spartans. So the Helots were comprised of those two groups, but there was a class in between, and they, they were literally in between. They were called the Perioikoi, which means the dwellers between. And they were the dwellers between the Spartans and the Helots. They were like a, 
an invisible to history, uh, but a very, very populous people mm -hmm. that insulated the Spartans from their, their slave classes, I suppose. Yeah. They fought in the Spartan armies. They were, because the Spartans were forbidden from any practice apart from making war, they were the ones who were making their armour, uh, making their clothing, making their pottery, their jewellery and things like that. They were the artisanal class, but it was also ah, right. the highest honour for their class to fight within the ranks of the Spartan armies as well uh, at the Battle of Plataea, for example, which was during the Greco-Persians wars and possibly the Spartans' greatest victory. Uh, there were 5,000 full-blooded homoioi Spartans on the battlefield. There were also 5,000 petty oikoi hoplites fighting with the Spartan armies, and there were 30,000 helts, as slaves, ah, in the army okay. as well, acting as retainers and skirmishes now would that have been sort of um because of need is that because would the would the spartans generally have, have, have fought purely as spartans but the uh, circumstance dictated that they get thirty thousand of the slave class in for that battle mm. no not at all um in fact they uh we always sort of imagine the spartans you know standing on the battlefield by themselves and you know, casting back hundreds of thousands of troops, but even even probably the most famous, the Battle of Thermopylae, Thermopylae um, during the Greco-Persian Wars as well, where there was 300 Spartans fighting. There were around about another 8,000 Greeks um, at that battle as well. They don't really get a lot of mention. But um, look, the, the, for, for such a... They really punch above their weight, the Spartans, you know. At, at their greatest extent, they only ever had 8,000 full-blooded homoioi troops to be able to call to field. And because they had a large population of slaves um, enslaved within their, their home territory, they couldn't afford to send massive armies out into the field. So the 8,000 troops never marched from Sparta, never fought anywhere at Plataea, which is a, a huge risk, as I said, only 5,000 went. Um, <clears throat> the Perioikoi, it was in their interest to, I guess, avoid becoming you know, downgraded and becoming helots. They, although they could never be upgraded to become Spartans, they were quite happy with their position. So if they were called out to fight, they would go out to fight the Spartans because, you know, better how we are now rather than them. So no, it was definitely because of need. They, they you know, they needed to have allies with them. Otherwise, they had a very insignificant force to, to, of which to take on enemies. But in most battles the Spartans fought, they were, were never the, the numerous um, troops that were on the battlefield. They were always, you know, the most important. They'd always assume the, the most important part of the battle line, which is generally the right-hand side. But uh, they were never the most numerous. I mean, th they're never going to be numerous, judging by how they pick them <laughs> <laughs> from birth. <laughs> I mean, cracky. You do well to get through it. You mentioned um, of, mm -hmm. you mentioned about them being they were separated from the mothers at four or five, and then they sort of went into this sort of communal um, living with all the other. I mean, were they were they sort of age? Were they was it like a class? So if you yes. know, you'd have a class seventy, or were they? Were they mixing with the older Spartan warriors at the same time? How did that work? Yeah, no, it was it was it was definitely age dependent, um, and and the schooling would change. You know, like for the first sort of six years, uh, it was predominantly a survival routine. You know, you learned to to live by your own wits. You were out in the cold. You know, you were living off the land, so to speak. Um, afterwards, you know, you'd move into a different age bracket where your your military training would begin in proper, and then after that, you'd form a sort of a reserve colony where you'd get some sort of apprenticeship towards the army but you definitely were with people of your age so you're in the five-year-old category you would be other, other five-year-old boys um your overlords would be a, a mixture of the garusia who were the the council of elders sparta was a, a gerontocracy at, at its heart so there was always elders around who so what's what what was that word uh, geron, geron, gerontocracy what, so like, what does uh, that mean count Old old council geriatric, basically. isn't it? Yeah, yeah geriatric. Yeah, that's where the word comes from. Yeah, gerontocracy, gerontocracy. Yeah. It's the um, Spartans that were retired from military life and were over sixty years of age. They were elected to this board of the Gerusia, um, which is the council of elders, and right. they were there for life after that. So they had control over some of the children. There were also uh, there was a term called boy herder, uh, the pythonomus, uh, who also had control of some of the boys. Once again, a, a cattle term that was um, that was used to denote what the, the role was within Spartan society. So this person literally herded the boys, took them through the various exercises and was also responsible for their behaviour. If one of the boys misbehaved, then fell poorly on the pythonomos and he was in turn punished by the Gerusia, which is also a little bit ironic considering if you if you punish the boys too harshly, then he was also punished. So you have to be very <laughs> Punishment is basically the answer for everything in Sparta. You're going to find the uh, the Goldilocks zone of punishment. Yes. You? <laughs> you well, which punishment's worse? I guess. Do you want to be beaten for not beating somebody enough or beaten for beating them too much? I was going to ask as well, um, 
where where does all this come from? The the need to do this? Why you know it's such a it's quite unique, isn't it? Yeah, Ancient that's what Sparta, I mean. this militaristic uh, culture is quite unique as far as we know as far as we can compare with with other ancient civilizations so that's interesting do we have does does anyone have a good idea how this could have evolved no and like, i think i said earlier on like to to try and understand it you have to look a little bit at, at ethnography um and there's definitely certain elements of other militaristic warriors warrior societies throughout history that have some similar elements there was a yeah uh, really yorkshire people from yorkshire <laughs> <laughs> I've met some people from Yorkshire. Like, <laughs> um, I'm sure they're great fans of the show. And uh, but uh, like by and large, they, they were unique. With with the if you take it as a whole, the way the Spartans uh, behave towards their youth, the way they behave towards women, the way they behave towards themselves and towards their enemies was completely unique. Um, there were elements of similar similarities. The Spartans practiced a fairly strict form of of pederasty. Um, we, we probably coincided with pedophilia these days, um, which gives it a very negative connotation. It's not to um, disavow the term from any sort of nastiness, but the Spartans took the raising of the youth very seriously. So most Spartan youths were paired off with an older man uh, who had completed the agogi, and he was designed to teach him not just the art of war and how to be a man, but there was definitely some sexual component to it. Uh, those That element of pederasty appears uh, in like Central Australian Aboriginal cultures, there's some Papua New Guinean cultures that have sure, something eh? similar. So you, yeah. you can draw certain ethnographic links between there and there. But as far as you know, putting your children into a state-sponsored education program that was designed to make them warriors uh, and the greatest warriors of all time, that never happened before. Um, it, it happened for two reasons. I think the, the first reason being that they had a large population of, of slaves and they needed to keep them under subjection. And the only way to do that was to basically turn Sparta into a into a military camp. Um, and the second reason would be just because of the, the very landscape itself. They lived in a very rocky, mountainous and, and rugged terrain. Um, and these terrains, these areas were easily defended by, by armies and soldiers. The land was very fertile. So I think perhaps this, this freed up the Spartans from the usual grind right of, of working the land yeah working the land so much yeah yeah and moreover this but the helots entirely entirely emancipated that them from that so i think that drew them towards more of a military culture from there it's almost it's like uh, it's like an early form of eugenics in a way isn't it the way the children or the the noble children the children in the upper class are sort of selected if that's the right word for it and it's the sort of survival of the fittest it's mm -hmm. quite disturbing and uh, you mentioned there about the way they were paired off with a, a an older spartan with a, a child who was like that's probably the wrong word but like a role model or someone who would mm -hmm. take over his training it just reminds me of it reminds me slightly of the sacred band from thebes the crack forces of the theban army and I wonder if there's yeah. any continuity there. Is there any sort of cultural link that maybe Thebes sacred band inherited something or some of this routine from Sparta? Yeah, yeah. Look, I'll, I'll just go back to your first point. First of all, um, I think it's important that we can we can talk about these things in history without any of sort of the, the modern um, you know, preconceptions of you know being taboo or worrying about being cancelled. Um, I think we. We forget and we we uh, mould history at our peril. You know, it's important to understand every element of it, and and we can safely leave it in history. Talking about any of history's nasty point doesn't go to show that we endorse any of it whatsoever. It just shows we have an understanding of what went before. So, absolutely, uh, I think we can use whatever language we, we want there. But as far as the the Theban sacred band goes, look, um, uh, Plutarch in the f in the second century wrote a um, a series of, of Spartan sayings down called the Apophagems. And in one of the sayings, uh, it says that it was a, a, a law from Lycurgus, who was Sparta's mythical uh, founder, said that they should avoid fighting the same army enemy too many times in that they might learn Sparta's tricks. And Agesilaos, who was a king uh, in the early 4th century, made that big exact mistake. He fought and defeated the Thebans continuously on the battle. And to be fair, over the past 300 years, the Thebans had a pretty bad rub of the green when it came to fighting the Spartans. Um, they really had a lot to... I looked at game by, I guess, getting the upper hand of them one of these days because the Spartans had certainly squashed them under the boot heel for a, a considerable period of time. So what happened at the end of the, at the beginning of the fourth century was Sparta fought Thebes in a series of, of wars and Thebes eventually learnt its lessons from, from Sparta's continuous defeats. There was a couple of 
brilliant generals um, that were coming through at the time as well, that were real revolutionary revolutionaries of the time. And they were very aware of Sparta's, um, I guess, its myth and its legend. Um, so they created the band called the Sacred Band and they made it a band of 300 soldiers. And look, that number was, <laughs> you know, was, yeah, we, we know about that number now. Um, in the 370s, 380s, when the band was formed, it was only 100 years after Thermopylae. Um, it was a very, very, you know, basically a, a middle finger to Sparta saying, you know, F you guys, you know, we can do this as well. And it was uh, 150 homosexual pairs. Um, this wasn't uncommon in, in Greek battlefields. Quite often um, they would put um, homosexual lovers next to each other. The idea, obviously, in, in ancient Greece was that um, there was no afterlife. You know, like the, the Christian church basically came along and said, you know, don't, don't worry about how you live your life. You know, just say sorry. God will forgive you. Everything will be okay. Didn't happen for the ancient Greeks. If the ancient Greeks died, they were dead. They went to Hades and they were forgotten about. They were a shade of spirit. The only thing they could be remembered by was their deeds on, on the battlefield, more or less. So you had to live like a brave man, like a good, good, a good man. And if you had your lover in the line beside you on the battlefield, you weren't going to turn tail and run. You didn't want to be a coward in front of your lover because he'd remember you as that. You wanted to die through acts of bravery. So it was a, it was a calculated move by the Thebans, but one that had happened several times before. And when they yeah. met the Spartans on the Battle of Lutra, uh, the fields of Lutra in 371, it was the sacred band that was absolutely pivotal in, in crushing Spartan might for all time. Wow. Yeah, the uh, trained them too well. It's like, yeah. it's a fascinating sort of uh, moment in history. You know, the themes have, have took it all in. They've had the tail whipped several times and then they've adapted. They've evolved. They've learned the lessons and mm. uh, the tables were turned. It's interesting. So was it kind of, um, I suppose, uh, wasn't taboo then to be in kind of a, a homosexual relationship then in ancient Greece? I, I've kind of heard that. Um, and uh, sort of the stuff about, yeah, the kind of the paedophilia and things like that. Um, and it wasn't necessarily looked on as a, a negative thing back then, basically. Not at all. Um, you know, <laughs> this is this is always taken incredibly misogynistically, but but it's it's not meant that way at all. But in, in ancient Greece, um, you know, Aristotle himself, who we who we um, you know we, we respect and adore from the future for his philosophies and all that, he he thought that it was scientifically provable that women were inferior to men. Um, and therefore... They had less you know, teeth. <laughs> that, I think that was Aristotle, wasn't it? <laughs> who was, who was it? Um, who's the guy, the father of medicine? Uh, Hipp Hippocrates? I'm sure he thought, he, he was convinced that the uh, they had less teeth, women. Yeah, yeah. They, they also believed that women didn't have a soul, I suppose, in, in so to speak. You know, uh, like, yeah, you haven't met my wife. <laughs> I've met some, yeah, I've, yeah. <laughs> I've met some pretty soulless guys too, so... Yeah. But... Um, Look, in saying that, it was almost a, a thing that that whilst you you know you could have a relationship with the woman and and it was essential to to carry on your line, um, you could never really truly love a woman the way that you could love another man. They didn't have the qualities with which right. that you should be esteeming. So no, it wasn't it wasn't taboo at all to right. uh, to have a homosexual relationship. In fact, it was incredibly common. Uh, I would say you know like vastly more common. I'd say than strictly heterosexual relationships. It would have been far more bisexuality i guess in in ancient greece and um relations with children uh weren't uncommon either the spartans mm. had some very strict rules around it and in fact if it was a relationship purely for pleasure then that was shunned and that was punishable within mm. spartan society not so in athens not so in thebes not so in mm. corinth and other cities but in sparta there were very strict forms around the pederasty that they had involved there and um moreover the the child, the the Erastes, the, the the lover, I guess you could say, was um, was personal responsibility of his older tutor, and the same with the the Pythonomus I mentioned earlier on. If the if the boy, the junior partner in the relationship, acted poorly, then it reflected badly upon his upon his senior lover as well. So it was a very strict and ritualized form in Sparta. But um, in answer to your question, no, it wasn't wasn't taboo at all. Um, mm. I think it's two thousand years of Christianity that's changed our yeah. morals somewhat. Absolutely, but, um, yeah. That was something very common. Yeah, very, what you've, you've yeah. got to get in your head, Matt, is that we are superior. <laughs> We're superior to the women. They're sort of below us. Yeah, well, in I, that way, so I, you probably would you would win a wrestling fight with your wife. I wouldn't. So. <laughs> um, I can't say that. I uh, mean, I, I'm thinking it was something I wanted to ask you, Steve. I mean, we, we you talked right at the beginning about the selection process for a baby when it's born. And we talked specifically about male babies because these are the ones, again, they have this attitude that males are superior to females and they're being groomed into into being this elite warrior. 
what happened? Was there? Oh, I don't want to say, was there abortions of like oh, pre after birth abortions of females? What was what was the outlook like if you were born a female? Do we even have that sort of information? Yeah, no, we we do, and and actually, great question. And individually, I think amongst the Spartans, we have good account of, of their women. Um, and in Athens, to 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 compare it. We probably have better account of the of the flute girls, the the courtesans, the prostitutes, rather than we do have have of, of Athenian women. But in Sparta, we have not only accounts of their women, we actually have their words as well. And um, and Plutarch, who I mentioned earlier on, who wrote some sayings of, of Spartan men, also recorded some sayings of Spartan women. And some of them, uh, one one I quite in particular, um, gives us a very good um, look at at how the Spartan women were, what regard the Spartan women were held in. And uh, there was a woman, a foreigner, that walked up to a a Spartan woman at one stage and said to her, how is it that you, you Spartan women have so much control over your men? And, this, and she said in passing, well, it's because Spartan women are the only ones who give birth to men. And it was a bit of a, a backward you know, sort of insult in that, you know, wherever this woman came from and whoever her sons were, they weren't real men in the form of the Spartans, but Spartan women uh, absolutely weren't discarded at birth. They weren't uh, aborted. There, there, there was, um, I guess exposure of babies that that weren't um, you know physically fit or emotionally fit or or just you know didn't really you know measure up um, according to Spartan customs that were exposed. There's, there's stories of, the, of that happening. They were left on uh, a mount a mountain not far from Sparta. Um, but Spartan women themselves were were just as important as Spartan boys, and the Spartan education system uh, was also there for the girls as well. Um, eugenics was an important part i mean obviously these girls were expected to one day grow up marry a spartan man and give birth to more spartan children so the spartan women were were educated if not as much or every bit as much as the as the spartan men um they were also given training that, that other girls in other cities weren't given it at all they were obviously with the men away on campaign a lot the spartan women became the the lords of the household so to speak and all Spartan families had land and land holdings that needed to be managed. Uh, the women had to do that. They did a lot of physical exercises uh, to, it was believed that, you know, a healthier body would make a healthier, I guess, garden bed for, you know, the planting of Spartan seed for the future generations. Um, we have recordings of, of Spartans, women's songs that they used to uh, stand around and sing. They had their own rituals that were a little bit homoerotic uh, in, their, in their own nature as well. And Spartan women throughout Greece were renowned for their um, almost licentious nature. Uh, there was a there's a, pa a play, a comedy by Aristophanes. Uh, he was a, a late fifth century uh, playwright, probably the, the, the father of, of old comedy. It's called the the Lysistrata, and it's set during the Pal. It was actually written and set during the Peloponnesian War. And the Athenian women decide the only way to bring this, uh, I think at the time about fifteen year war, uh, to conclusion was to go on a sex strike. And to go on a sex strike, they decided to all hold up on top of the uh, of the Acropolis and withhold sex from their men to try and bring their men to the to the negotiating table. And there was a, a Spartan woman who who came from Sparta to join the Athenian women in this sex strike. And uh, there's a, there's quite a lot of lewd references to how firm her body is. Like uh, they, one line says, like Lampito, what a fine pair of breasts you have, you know. And, she says, oh, well, thank you. I can do, you know, heel to butter jumps. And it's more to, to define how fit and how healthy and how um, active the Spartan women were as comparison. So, no, look, they absolutely were a massive part of society. Um, yeah, Spartan heiresses, particularly towards the end of, of the Spartans primacy, were incredibly uh, you know, popular and hard to get hold of items because they, they could have uh, patrimony, they could have land inheritance and things like that. And they held a considerable portion of the wealth within Sparta too. Now, they were very liberated by, by ancient Greek standards. Mm. that's the kind of thing that that i've heard is that they were sort of by the standards of the time much more involved in in society so it's quite interesting um to we, hear that we get told you know fast forwarding <coughs> back to 2021 mm. the narrative we are often told about history is um women have been oppressed forever and i would argue that it's people have been oppressed forever I and mean, if you read roman history and greek history there are a lot of powerful women mm -hmm. um even in our country boudicca yeah you know Boudicca, there, there, there have been powerful it's same with egypt 
Mm-hmm. Um, it's more uh, it's more of a class issue, I think, than a than a yeah. gender issue. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are argument. You know, men have taken primacy mm. for physical reasons. You know, the, you can't get away from the biology. We are stronger. We are the ones who have to. Our job is to sacrifice. Uh, over history, our job has been to sacrifice ourselves mm. for our wives and our children. Mm-hmm. And the, the, so there are cultural echoes of that which, which make the way through to today. Um, so. Yeah. I just wanted to maybe go off on a bit of a tangent, though. Um, mm. Something that was kind of percolating in my mind Ooh. was... Um, I've been thinking... You, you kind of mentioned sort of the 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 slave class. Did you say there was a, around about 30,000? Did you say 30,000? Did I remember that? That in, was in the, the army. Compliment that, that went right, okay. the army there, yeah. So... Um, so you said at maximum there was eight thousand Spartans. Is that is that right in the entire right. state? So how many slaves? Did they, did they can they take a guess at how many slaves they were sort of overseeing with that amount? It's impossible to to truly say. I mean, if you were to take it from the Battle of Plataea, where there was six times the number of um, of Spartan soldiers, uh, sorry, six times the number of helots at the battle than there were Spartan soldiers, then you could roughly estimate that there were, you know, six times the amount of male. Pop, mm. uh, citizen or populations within those places but that that's not a fair indication of it either um you know of those eight thousand, there would have been innumerable amount of spartans that just couldn't make the grade and therefore weren't, weren't counted as spartans they would have fallen into the different um inferior classes that were around there was also you know massive amounts of, of perioikoi um some some estimates put them at equal numbers to the um to the helot class as well mm. but most historians give a rough number of between eight to ten times more mm. uh helots uh, within the Peloponnese, Spartan Peloponnesian Empire, than there were actual um, Laconian homoios. Mm. So, what I was going to ask is: Is there any kind of record of a, like a slave uprising from mm. that? You know, oh, where they yeah. they gave it a go and uh, tried <laughs> to yeah. take them on Conti- continuously. Yeah. Right, look, okay. I mean, Pausanias, uh, he was a, a Greek travel writer. He's basically like the, I guess, the, the grandfather of the Lonely Planet book. He um, travelled Greece and he, you know, wrote like more or less a travel novel. And it reads, you know, very much like a like a Lonely Planet. You know, this is very had, you know, it's very stayed. This is very had some, you know, good stuff to drink. This is very ate some good food. This is very <laughs> check out a nice temple. It was, um, you know, this is where you should stay. Don't talk to this person. You know, very, very, uh, very contemporary uh, from when he was writing it. Um, this there was a, the first the first sort of recorded war of Sparta was called the First Mycenaean War, and it was when the the Spartans first decided to defy their geography, and they went around Mount Taygetus to the west and conquered um, the Pamissos Valley, which was um, I guess the Mycenaean territory's really fertile area, and that was where they I guess they first started practicing helotry on the western side of the Taygetus Mountains. They possibly enslaved some um, indigenous populations in the Laconian region prior to that. That was in around 740 to 720 BCE. Now, there was wow. a second Mycenaean War about 20 to 30 years later, if you were to believe the chronology, which was a general uprising of those Mycenaean helots. And it was another 20-year conflict in which Sparta ultimately won and enforced their servitude across more broader areas of Mycenae. But from that period of time, there was anywhere from four to five slave uprisings of serious nature over the next three to 400 years before the Battle of Lutra, which is the, the end point, I guess, for, for, for um, the, the true Spartan narrative. From there, they become you know, a part of the crowd rather than they're being set apart. The most significant one happened in 464 BCE. Uh, there was a, a massive earthquake in Sparta um, from seismology, from archaeoseismology, they estimated to be about 7.6 on the Richter scale. So she was a big one. And um, not that Sparta was a well-developed, uh, area like Athens with large buildings and things like that, but it caused a lot of destruction in Sparta itself. The epicenter was only about four kilometres to the west of Sparta. Uh, this caused a general uprising of the helots and, the Sp- and Sparta was in a lot of trouble. Now, there was a, a Greco alliance that was still loosely in place following the Greco-Persian wars and Sparta lent on that and called in aid from other Greek cities. Athens came to help them, I think, with about four or 5,000 troops uh, to help them put down the revolt. But the Athenians were so disgusted that the Spartans had... Not, not enslaved, the Athenians had slaves too, but they'd enslaved Greeks. And that really stuck in the core of every other Greek city that was out there because it was one thing to, you know, capture barbarians and bring them back to, you know, work your silver mines or, or row your boats, but to enslave Greeks who 
um, you know, according to Aristotle, had the spirit of, of freedom and the, the soul of the gods, so to speak. That was a, that was an incredibly taboo thing. So the Spartans ended up sending that army packing and, and put down the slave revolt themselves. But yeah, absolutely. The, the, the helots were always uh, looking mm. to, to revolt. The Spartans lived in a military camp. Uh, there was a famous saying that the Spartans merely had a wolf by the throat in the Mycenaean mm. people, that um, they had to continuously put them down. They went out into the, into the world they had a secret police called the Crypteria, <laughs> whose sole job was to uh, instill a reign of terror amongst the helots. You know, they'd yeah. go out into the night and, you know, summarily execute, and burn houses down, you know, burn fields, uh, do whatever they could to create terror. Um, you know, they were, they were scared. And that was also why they, they never liked to march large armies out of Sparta. They needed to have a massive mm. manpool, manpower to call upon to mm. be able to put them down should they need to. So, yeah, this, <laughs> the helots being... Greeks at heart and being Dorians moreover, you know, cousins of the Spartans weren't happy with being being enslaved and never were. And after Lycra, the first thing the Thebans did was liberate those uh, those Mycenaean helots and created the new city for them called Megalopolis, which was uh, to, the, to the north of Sparta, basically, you know, shutting Sparta in the southern half of the Peloponnese forevermore after that. Oh, my God, I love it. I mean, is part of the problem. What were the Spartans like when it comes to record keeping? Was writing either for record keeping or for uh, drama or fiction or whatever? Was I mean, because it's such a, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that because it's such a militaristic state that maybe record keeping was put on the back burner, and this is why we sort of have to guess and interpret and look at ethnography and archaeology to try and piece the puzzle together. Is there some? Is there any truth in that? Absolutely, yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, the Spartan Mirage says that um, there was no writing within Sparta. Um, that's that's not true. But you know, for looking back historically, it's, it, it might as well be true. Like we have no uh, prose writings from Sparta survive whatsoever. Uh, we have some some poetic writings that have come down from some archaic poets. Uh, Tertius and, and Terpander were were uh, Spartan poets that lived in the perhaps the late eighth, early seventh century BCE and wrote some, some extremely beautiful bellicose poetry. Uh, around, <laughs> you know, being, oh, I was very, it was war poetry, you know, stand shoulder to shoulder with your man, you know, thrust out with your spear, you know, don't <laughs> run away and get shot by an arrow in the back. You know, you'll be a coward. Nobody will like you for that. All this sort of stuff. <laughs> um, but really the first proper writing we have of, of, of about Sparta comes from Herodotus right, um, yeah. and then obviously Thucydides. I mean, Herodotus was neither Athenian or Spartan, but he was an exile from Asia Minor, perhaps uh, participated in a revolt against um, the local Persian uh, overlords, but he was probably more Athenian in his, his sympathies. Uh, we have Thucydides who was a general during the Peloponnesian War and had the, uh, had the he just, his arguable honour of being defeated by a couple of Spartan generals in the battlefield as well. So he was no huge friend of Sparta, though he certainly <laughs> admired their um, military capacities. And it's not really until we hit Xenophon, who was um, uh, very early 4th century, was a disciple of, of Socrates, who was so disillusioned with his home city's um, forced suicide of Socrates that uh, he actually left Athens and then took up residence in Sparta. He was given some some land there. He actually put his two children through the Agoga as well. And he was he was a true laconophile. He was a, he was good friends with the king at the time, Agassilaos. And uh, his writings form some of the really important stuff. But that is the only real, I guess, contemporary account we have of of Spartans. And it was from a you know a Spartan sympathising Athenian at the end of the day. Mm, so yeah, we have absolutely nothing. Yeah, look, the Spartans had writing. They've they've excavated. Uh, the ancient region of Sparta and they've found, you know, plinths with, with Greek lettering on them. There's even a bench which speaks a lot to uh, how the Spartans used to hold their their elderly in regard. The bench actually says, if you're a young person, an old person comes along, stand up and let them sit down. So, you know, we have that in, a, in an epigraph, epigraphical form. Um, we have inscriptions from, even from a, a woman who, who won some Olympic crowns. Uh, she was the sister of King Agassilaos. She won a couple of chariot crowns at the... Um, at the Olympics uh, in the early fourth century. Of, of course, she wasn't there racing the horses, but she trained them. Um, so, yeah, we have some epigraphical evidence of that, but nothing prose, no no works like Herodotus or anything like that coming from a Spartan source whatsoever. So it's all, yeah, like you say, archaeology, ethnography, a little bit of guesswork. Yeah, mm. piece it together. That I've never heard, and I love the fact that you use this term, laconophile. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean most people... 
unless you've read a bit of ancient history, you've probably never heard of Lacedaemonia or Laconic. You might have heard the term Laconic, um, but this sort of term we use, Laconic speech. So, Clint, uh, if you ever listen to Dan Carlin, Hardcore History. I love him. It's amazing, isn't it? He? he did, um, I'm guessing it was on the, he must have done, it must have been the series he did on the Achaemenid Persians. He must have talked about the Battle of Thermopylae, the, the Hot Gates, the 300. And he goes into this um, discussion or this description of where the term laconic comes from. Like we would describe Clint Eastwood as a laconic actor, this sort of, uh, the way you use words to... Uh, Using the least possible words mm-hmm. to get your point across, but this is some. This is a cultural thing that goes back two and a half thousand years that we still use today. It's. It, I think Dan Collin makes the point that, if nothing else, the fact that the this race of well, not race is the wrong word, but this society of warrior people, over two and a half thousand years have handed us down this word. To describe them, it's one of the few things that we know about them that that's, that's mm. unique about them is is the way they talk, which is incredible. Because you know how long have we had recorded sound, recorded music, mm. but this has been passed down over two and a half thousand years that we have a, a an idea of how these these guys actually taught laconic, mm. and we gave it and you know it was named after them. So what what tells where that comes from? Yeah, uh, it was it was also a term that was. Whether it was coined in the ancient time, it was definitely a, a feature of, of Spartan speech and communication that was well understood uh, in the ancient Greek world. There was a there's a an anecdote that um, Philip of Macedon, so Alexander the Great's father, sent the Spartans a, a message, and this is post Battle of Lutra, mind you. So they've they've long ceased since ceased being one of the premier powers of ancient Greece, but he sent a message to the Spartans saying something along the lines of, "If." I came into the Peloponnese and fought you Spartans. You would be crushed. And the Spartans sent back simply a message, if. <laughs> so they left it at that. Um, you know, the, the mere term, obviously, modern labe, which you've heard before, uh, you know, come and get them. The, the, the speech, the conic speech was actually something that was taught as well during the Agoga. When wow. children were asked to give uh, answers or to expound upon some topic, they were actually punished if they used too many words in describing it where they were praised when they could use as as few words as possible to, mm. to impart the meaning. So within, like Scientology. A yeah. <laughs> little bit, yeah. 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 Well. <laughs> I was just going to say, well, that that maybe, would you not say that has like a military benefit in yeah, that? A, if efficiency, you, that's yeah. That's what I mean, obviously. Shouting orders, yeah. Yeah. You, 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 Every, everything's geared. Yeah, Everything in the society is geared towards military supremacy. It's amazing. Yeah, that's what I mean. Absolutely, yeah. Everything. yeah. Yeah, clipped and message speech. You, you can you can see that in the military today, mm. and it was definitely a facet of Sparta. I mean, the the, the thought of Sparta as a, a functioning military camp is a good one to have. That's exactly how it was seen. Um, mm. You know, the the war footing they were on a war footing perpetually, and they yeah. were at war for the bulk period of time from the, from their history from the start to the end. But they were also at war continuously. You know, they they had a a massive population of slaves who were hostile towards them for very good reason. That within, you know, within their houses, they were farming their lands so, with their children. So, yeah, I think the, that method of speech was was uh, was very helpful and conducive to their society. And I guess the term laconophilia, um, that's a relatively modern speech. We, you know, uh, the Greek word phile, philis, uh, philis means friend. We, we use the word affiliate these days, which is where that right. word comes from. And uh, Lacona, Laconia is the the reason the region where the the Greeks came, uh, the Spartans came from. So Laconophilia is just yeah, you know, a lover of of all things Spartan. And you mentioned the term Lacedaemonian um, is a good one. Uh, it's, that doesn't get bandied around too much. But Sparta was a funny place in that Sparta was was the city, um, and Spartans were the people. But also Lacedaemon was the was the state. And Lacedaemonia mm. was the the region, I suppose, and Lacedaemons were the people. So they had some interesting terms that sort of intertwined in there. But yeah, Laconia is the is the broader region around um, the city of Sparta. And there's there's a certain well, if if you can take Herodotus at his word and whatnot, but there's a certain <laughs> sort of uh, dark humour towards it as well with the the laconic speech. So I think mm-hmm. it's when um, Xerxes sends his emissary to the 300. So we're told in legend. Yeah, I wasn't there. I don't know if it's true or not. I'm an old romantic, so I hope it's true. Mm-hmm. But the emissary says like uh, Xerxes, we ha- we have so many archers. 
when we, when we loose our arrows, it will block out the sun, mm -hmm. the amount of arrows, and the Spartan general or the Spartan whatever says, "Excellent, we will fight in the shade." Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, oh my god, like you couldn't write that for Clint Eastwood. I'm yeah, pretty sure those guys are great. I'm pretty sure Gerard Butler said that. Did he in the yeah. film? I'm Did he? Sure it he was. Um, that, yeah. It was. Uh, who's who's the guy that plays Professor X in the X Men? That that. Um, <laughs> He was the one in, in 300 that said, can't they do it? Patrick Stewart? <laughs> no. Oh, no, no. Sorry, not, oh, not Professor X. Sorry, Magneto. The, the new Magneto. T. Oh. Earl Grey, hot. <laughs> uh, Michael Fassbender, is it? Fassbender, that's Fassbender. it. He's the one that says it in the, in the movie. Mr. Right. Fassbender, yeah. I, didn't I mean, look, the, the persons were... All right. They, they were just utterly confused by the Spartans, you know? Like, every mm. other city had submitted to them on the way through. And I think it was on the eve of the third day of that battle, uh, which was the last day... Xerxes sent a you know a scout to see what the Spartans are up to. Like, go and check these guys out. They must be over there quivering in fear. But the scout came over and found out they're they're oiling themselves, they're brushing their beards, they're 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 taking exercise, you know. It's just they were just utterly bewildered. Like, what these guys are insane. They're utterly insane. Just another yeah. day at the military camp. Yeah, it? they're just, just gro grooming themselves and, and doing body weight exercises and like the the the, uh, the emissary goes back to Xerxes and it's like, what are they doing? Well, Working out. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, um, Xerxes Zer Zer had a, a Spartan king in his entourage, didn't he? Right. Right. So, so, did. so we're told. Anyway, we don't. It's uh, Herodotus. He yep. But, you know, yep. the Xerxes the, um, consults this Spartan king and says, you know, my emissary says they're doing body weight. They're doing squats <laughs> and, co and combing the hair. What's going on? He says, well, they're preparing to fight. Yeah. It's like, well, I'm at the, I'm at the head of an army of 100,000. Mm. There's 300 Spartans and a few thousand Greeks. Yeah, yeah, they're gonna fight. They're gonna fight till they die. Mm. It's just, it's. I mean, it's just. It blows it, my mind. Yeah, I love it. Absolutely love it. I think the other thing as well is that at that time, if Xerxes' army was a hundred thousand strong, surely that would have just been unimaginable, wouldn't it? That that size of force at that time. Nothing unusual. We no. we have it in our heads that. You know, we talk about like the Battle of Hastings and stuff, where we mm. we had piddling armies of like five thousand. The Romans, they had massive, massive armies made yeah. up from countries all over Europe and, and North Africa. Mm. They had, obviously, not all Romans. They, 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 they brought in, you know, they had mm. the Sarmatian cavalry and and auxiliaries from, from all over. You know, but that was part of the deal. You mm. you come under Rome, you pay taxes, and when we ask, you provide troops mm -hmm. for, for the legions, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I would argue that our, our armies... Mm, two thousand, two and a half thousand years ago, would have been bigger. You know, the, 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 those size of armies won't have been eclipsed probably till well, definitely not till Napoleon. Yeah, absolutely. No, you're hundred percent right. Um, I mean, the Romans are, are a great one to bring up. I mean, at the Battle of Cannae, which was the, the <laughs> don't third, bring that the third up. Battle. Yeah, the third battle of you know the the Second Carthaginian War and. After already suffering two you know, massive defeats at the Battle of Trebia Ford and Lake Tresemane, the Romans still managed to punch out another 70,000, you know, basically citizens at this stage. They weren't an empire and, you know, 000. confront Hannibal. And they were wiped out to a man almost, apart from, a, you know, I think a force of 10,000 to escape. They were, they were wiped out. And, and definitely when you look at the, the Roman invasions of Greece against the Macedonian empires at that time, the battles were... Yeah, evenly fought 50,000 people each side. Um, when Alexander the Great went into Persia and, and yeah. fought at Gorgamella and the the uh, Granicus, the river, uh, he was up against forces of hundreds of thousands of, of troops uh, at those stages. It's the, the logistical uh, mm. nightmare that it would have created to be able to support and feed and, you know, uh, stable those sorts of cavalry contingents and things like that was just out of control. Like, like you say, Phil, we wouldn't have had armies like that until probably the Napoleonic era again. Mm. That's yeah. the size and scope, you know. It simply just people just couldn't afford it. That's what. I was gonna, yeah, <laughs> the, the amount, just the amount of food, grain, water, hay, the the, the massive baggage train. Mm, yeah, you know. Yeah. It, but it, I mean, no, Napoleon made the sea change where he he, mil he uh, militarized the entire country, mm. uh, which hadn't been seen before for for hundreds and hundreds of years. You know, because there just wasn't the there weren't the money for it mm. at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, it was obviously like significant Herodotus. <laughs> He sort of, I guess, counter counterposes the, the Persian advance into Greece via the rivers that they camped by, and he breaks the rivers down into two broad categories: either rivers that were completely drunk dry by the army, or rivers that weren't. And I, I mean, it, it's sort of laughable to imagine an army drinking dry any river, but 
I think it's more of a poetic reference to simply how many people yeah. were at those areas, you know, and I've been to a lot of those places the armies have stopped out along and I've seen those rivers that they couldn't possibly be drank dry, like it's some sort of crazy phenomenon. But in Herodotus's mind, the the sheer scope of the armies, and he would have spoken directly to people who were at the battlefields, who would have seen the wars themselves and who more than likely fought in them. Um, so it would have been his impression of it later, later on that you know, these armies were so enormous that mm. the bodies of water would have taken to to quench their thirst would have been massive by scope. Mm. Yeah. Well, Steve, we've brought up past an hour just now yeah. already. Oh, well. I don't know where <laughs> it's gone. Yeah, so we're we coming back next week. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime, it's a lot of fun. It's really good. <laughs> no, I've really enjoyed it. I, yeah, I it's could, good. I could talk ancient history all day. But yeah. so as someone who's so knowledgeable about, about these subjects across Rome and mm. and Greece and all the rest of it, and um, I think uh, a lot of the, what I've taken away from this and something I've learned over the last 12, 18 months as well is going mm. back to the original sources. Mm. Uh, we kind of, in our modern day, we think they're, cl- they're kind of stuffy and maybe not very interesting. But, I mean, you, you describe Paulson Paulson. Pulsan- I can't even say it. Pulsanius? Pulsanius, yeah. Pulsanius. It's like the travel writer. And we've got mm-hmm. Herodotus, who's like, um, I call him more like the the father of journalism than history because he's, he's like, a, he's going around and reporting. He's interviewing people and reporting on what mm-hmm. they say, whether it's Egypt and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And uh, for the first time, I read some Sophocles, who's like mm-hmm. the famous Greek playwright. Mm-hmm. He wrote Oedipus. Mm-hmm. And, uh, well, we won't get into Oedipus, but, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I absolutely loved it. And, like, I'm not a fan of plays. I never I never enjoyed Shakespeare or anything like that at school. I'm just a northern working class guy who's interested in history. And I was I couldn't put it down. Wow. There's a reason why these this stuff has stood the test of time for two and a half thousand years, because mm. it's that good. I'd Ooh. recommend, I read the three Theban plays by Sophocles, and it was like, favourite book of the year. <laughs> Fucking yeah. loved it. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I've uh, really enjoyed this, and uh, mm. encourage everyone to go back to the sources, read some ancient Greek stuff, some Roman yeah. stuff. Also go and yeah. see uh, Steve's podcast. Absolutely. SpartanHistoryPodcast.com. Exactly. Links in the show Thank notes. Mm. Yeah, look, links are in the show notes as ever. And you're on Twitter as well, at mm. Spartan underscore history, if anyone wants to follow you. Right. And uh, yeah, well, I've really enjoyed our chat, and uh, yeah, love to do it again sometime. Definitely. Um, thanks for getting up early for us. Oh yes. No, well, thanks for staying up late for me. Nah, <laughs> we're used to that. <laughs> yeah. Right. We'll sign off, Steve. Is there anything yeah. you want to say before we go? Yeah. Before no, we... not at all. But just look, thank that. Thanks for having me on the show. It's always a pleasure to talk uh, Spartan and ancient history more generally. And um, yeah, I'd love to come back sometime. And I wish you guys yeah. all the best in your show. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Uh, can't wait to hear some more episodes. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Same goes to you. Mm-hmm. And we'll catch you on the flip side. Don't touch that dial. Do not. Stay with us while we play ourselves out. Yeah. We'll catch you on the other side, Steve. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Ben. <laughs>